There are two magic snowdrops that are very, very good at producing seedlings. When I say producing seedlings, their pollen is very fertile. The first one is trim, and the other one is actually this uh, yellow snowdrop here. It's a changeling, so it has elements of green and yellow in it, and it's called chameleon. And Wendy's gold is actually quite good as well, that produces the yellow element in seedlings. I like this little cardamony. Um, oh, yes. Quinquifolia, and it's a spreader. So if you have an aversion to things that sort of take you over a bit, don't grow it. Hey. Shall I go on to daffodils? You go on to daffodils, Val. Right. Well, I'm going to hold up this one, which is a large daffodil. Most of the early daffodils that you grow um, are small dinky jobs, but this is about a foot high and it's Rheinveld's sensation. When this first emerged from Holland, probably about 20 years ago, it was mega expensive. It's so cheap now, but, and it will flower in a good year at Christmas. It's a bit late this year because we've had so much dull weather, but that's the, always the earliest big daffodil in my garden. And I've got a couple of, um, uh, little daffodils. This is rather malformed, actually. Um, this is candle power. Oh, which is a dinky six inch high one. But can you see the difference in the color? It emerges yellow and then it goes this wonderful buttermilk color. And I love it when plants morph into different colors. So I've got a lot of candle power in my garden on the sunny edges in front of the snowdrop so that they have something as they go over. And um, it's quite hard to get. Um, quality daffodils, Ron Scamp's uh, firm, now run by his son Adrian. Quality daffodils is do sell it. It's quite quite pricey, but once you've got it, you don't lose it. But I think if you go to Scamp's, it's not as expensive as it can be in some places. I think it's one of those bulbs where the price is quite far ranging. Um, I think it's the same with all plants. There's so certain nurseries that you just don't you don't go onto their website. You don't go onto their <laughs> website. I'm not going to say who they are, by the way. <laughs> but I have Yorkshire jeans. <laughs> I was looking up Candle Power the other day, and was it named after the, the 70s blackouts or named during them? I don't know whether it was or not. I don't know where it came from, but I, I saw it in somebody's garden. I've got another little darling, which is called Navar, N A V A. Double R E, which is named after a place in Spain, a region of Spain, I think. And a lot of these early daffodils are Spanish. And, um, you know, they've given rise, they're, they're the backbone behind all our miniature daffodils because Alec Gray crossed these Spanish daffodils and species, collected all he could, collected, crossed them with his uh, cut flower tour varieties and managed to produce all this stuff like Tater Tate and Jumbly which were no good for cutting, but <laughs> bless you, Alec Gray. And then I finished it Chlaminius, even despite oh. my soil. Uh, a lot of people say this is an acid soil lover, and I don't have a lot of it, but it does come up year after year, which um, I, I can't say about the hoop daffodils in my garden. They don't return very often. But um, I've got a lot of little miniature daffodils scattered about with their, you know, um, there'll be loads of daffodils later. I'm looking forward to getting you back when there are even more daffodils to talk about. That's a really lovely show for, for February. Yes. Well, I, I've, I've got some shrubby things here. Um, obviously, I'm very cold and exposed in my garden. And, uh, you know, the wind whistles through and the heavy rain falls. And it's not called cold Aston for nothing. <laughs> and a lot of my winter shrubs, this is winter sweet, uh, get shriveled up in the wind and the rain. So they might have a glorious few days. But I grow um, 12 different witch hazels far too close together. <laughs> and this is one called Aurora. And, you know, the flowers are small this year because we had quite a dry summer. And John Massey waters his uh, copiously in the summer and gets much bigger flowers. But I don't put water on the garden at all because I'm a green person and I don't like to. I do water containers. But these have been through storm Eunice, Franklin, and actually our worst day was in the middle, our windiest day. Um, a shed actually landed in the field by the sheep uh, and somebody came and collected it. We don't know whose shed it was, but uh, this is Aurora. And if you were, if we could do smelly vision, this one 
smells of freesias. Although it's a butterscotch colour, it smells of freesias, and it's just as scented as the acrid yellow pallida. So uh, I grow a lot of witch hazels for the simple reason that they will survive the awful weather of cold Aston. And Daphne's are pretty good as well, but I'm not picking my Daphne's. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Cursor, which is a very good small cherry, um, just about to throw some flower as well. And then I have this, and I expect Alan knows this, um, Ribes laurifolium. Yeah. That needs a very shelter position. It's very lax. It's not a beautiful thing, uh, particularly to look at in the garden, but it flowers from about January onwards. And when the flowers first come out, they're quite limey green. It's a lovely thing to pick. I haven't picked many winter flowers because I haven't had many visitors because COVID is keeping everybody battened down fairly still. So I often have people who come in January when there's nothing much going on and they think, oh, I'll go and have a cup of tea at Val's and see if Joe's made some of his nice scones. And I'll pick a little winter posy. And that, it's great for that. Uh, and uh, I think I'm done. I'm showed <laughs> and held out. I think, I think one of the things that I love to see is Ribes laurifolium underplanted with green hellebores. I mean, I know yes. it's green on green. You see? But it's, yeah. It's just that time of the year and that it looks lovely. Now, if you threaded a few, um, a few of the uh, trim, trimlet, trimposta, uh, south haze, some of those green tip snowdrops through it, um, you know, there's, there's a wonderful winter picture for you. I know, you see, you're artistic. I had to dig my hellebores up in 2004, five, yeah. with one week's notice and replant them. And mine are just a glorious jumble. I don't have any artistry. I mean, if I was artistic like Alan, I would have uh, probably plummy and pink, shades of pink all round this tree because it would work yeah. really well. But I've just got a well, multitude. It's I funny actually you should, do it's, have two more things. I just, well, it's funny you should say about the jumble of hellebores, Val, because that's exactly what I want. <laughs> Maybe because I have no well, that's artistry. That's what but to me, like the idea of, of looking through a whole range of yellows and purples and the pinks and just the pinky yes. ones and all like lovely yeah. different colours all together. That mine come out a bit more today when, when my snowdrop friend comes at two o'clock, you know, um, I'm going to dig up this trillium for him or he's going to dig it up and take it away. Um, Lucky Elizabeth him. Spangman's father won the Farrah medal with it and I've got two of them and he's a trillium nut. I did forget, this is rather a tatty flower actually of Penny's Pink, which is one of Rodney David's uh, hybrids with marbled foliage. I grow that in pots either side of my front door oh. and it's much more useful than Anna's Red or the white ones because actually these are not petals, they're tepals. So they're very weather resistant. This is a very old flower. I didn't want to take any of the lovely ones off. But um, it's a really good thing because the flowers are big. You see my hand, they're, they're big. The foliage is lovely. It's got a nice arching shape and it will flower from about January. And then you'll get a sort of dried presence from it because these backs will go darker right up through April, May time. And then they just get put by the greenhouse, bit of feed, and then they come out next year and they're just a bit of floral magic. I did have to, uh, one more thing, which I've forgotten to show. Oh. Um, the wonderful uh, polypodium cambricums which are now just beginning to look a bit ragged. But in midwinter, these are like little Christmas trees on the ground. And because they're polypodes, many footed, they spread into quite big clumps. The best one is Richard Case, K-A-Y-S-E, collected from a very nasty outcrop somewhere, I think in the Bristol area. I don't know whether, I haven't looked that up, but um, it's still there because nobody can get to it, which is good news. <laughs> Uh, but I love these polypodes and um, uh, John Massey, I was at his garden the other day and he's got snowdrops coming up through his. And the great late Christopher Lloyd used to grow dryopteris, which are cut back at Christmas time and form these brown knuckles. And then the snowdrops come up around the brown knuckles and then the, the fiddles, uh, fiddle neck croziers come out in April with the bluebells and hide the snowdrop foliage. I'm shut now. I'm <laughs> That's a good tip, though, isn't it? For a lovely, a shady yes. area in your garden or a north, a north facing area in your garden, because 
you know, you've got the, you have your snowdrops early, and then later you have the croziers unfurling of your ferns, um, and you've got interest there for the rest of the year. I mean, it is yeah. stunning. All you, all you need is a few um, white variegated hostas to accompany them, perhaps, and then you've got a picture. I hostas. I'm very anti-hosta. Why? I, I should. I just don't like them. Oh, I good. No oh, good. I think it's. I think. I think it's rather interesting oh, when we have a person on it for you. I think if I have thirty-two there. acres, envy, envy, envy. I would find room for. I just got a third of an acre, and a third of that is fruit and vegetables because the best beloved would kill me. And if I put snowdrops up there, it would be in the Daily Mail. Pitchfork through woman. <laughs> I, I think don't. you're right, though, Alan. It's it's great yeah. to hear. Like Val knows what she likes, and yeah, it's great I, to I hear love, it. I love shade lovers, and of course, when I came here in 2004 with one week's notice, it's a south-facing garden high up in the Cotswolds, and there was nothing in it, so I had to cast the shade before I could grow things like trillions. But I do love my shade-loving plants, and and I love my witch hazels. So. I, I've sort of got, I sort of got there, but not in an artistic way, Alan. Well, I, not everything that I do is artistic, Val. I mean, it, I was going through the winter garden the other day, and I mean, that's where I'm putting lots of the new snowdrops that I actually get nowadays, yes. um, because we've now got just the right amount of shade. Yes. And we've got lots of deciduous um, plants in there, like various birches and things, and because they... Yes you let the light in, in the winter and in the summer there's light shade yeah um, and i was thrilled the other day just walking through to find a group of hepaticas oh, yes and john your your friend john massey i mean he spends the greater part of his day i think watering his collection of hepaticas he doesn't he's at... in the middle of writing a book about them which is nearing completion right and it's going to be fabulous i've looked at the uh, through it with him and and read the first paragraph paragraphs it's going to be wonderful his new hepatica book so we've all got to buy that. Well, we have got to buy it. But, I mean, I was interested to see that some hepaticas on his site are actually £100 each. And yes. they're very, very rare. And he's seen, he's, he's, I think he's seen virtually all but one growing in the wild across the world, yes, from Japan lovely. to Asia, mm. yeah, to yeah, Europe. It's amazing. He knows more than anyone, I think. And yeah. I, I've got one that I got from John called Kilmerston Pink, which is mm -hmm. came from Robin White, who had Blackthorn Nursery in Hampshire. Yeah. And um, it's a real treasure, and I waited a long time to get it, and it was expensive. And it keeps being tucked up. And I've had to put, I put a cloche around it, but of course you can't put a cloche around the hepaticas because they like cool root runs. So now it's got a little ring of twigs around it. I don't know whether it's my new cat, Frank, squirrels, mice, possibly rats, but something is definitely attacking hepaticas, and I don't know oh, why. But well, anyway, we, I have preserved it and it is in flower and Ellison Spence is in flower. So I've got lots of hepaticas uh, in flower at the moment. I must, I must widen my net, I think. Yes. I think you must. Well, that's a trouble, isn't it? But yes, it is. But the one thing that put me off was the fact that um, Munchak deer, which we frequently get in the garden. I mean, they're not invited, but they seem to find their yeah. way in. Um, they, they munch the foliage. Yeah. And they take all the foliage off my violets as well. Well, that's annoying. I've just built, been to a well-known um, cheap store and bought ten hanging baskets, which will never get hung, but they will be they will be uh, positioned over treasures like Kilmerston Pink. Uh, yes, stop them because they dug up all my candle yeah. power, the little blighters um, earlier in the year, just when they were coming into into bud. They didn't eat them; they just dug them up. And I, oh. I put a lot of leaf litter in, and I wonder whether they've buried. Um, walnuts or something. Anyway, I, I don't know whether it's squirrels or what, but yeah, real problem. But a lot of the really expensive hepaticas can't be grown in a garden anyway. So the cheaper ones are the best ones, a bit like snowdrops. Yeah. yeah. Expensive, unless you know it's good. <laughs> They're more reliable, I think, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, as, as someone who doesn't have any hepaticas, but has coveted many, but I do find myself, you know, looking at one and then looking up its price and being terrified. So which ones should us normal mere mortals be looking for, Val? Harvington Beauty is a lovely blue. And uh, it was named by Hugh Nunn, who raised the Harvington strain of hellebores. He found it in a derelict garden. Um, an old lady died in the village of Harvington 
It's near Evesham. It's confusing because there's two harvestings in them. Um, and he was living there. And he got into Hellebores because his next door neighbour was Elizabeth Ballard, who was Helen Ballard's daughter. But he spotted this hepatica and thought it was lovely. And it was in other gardens. And then the bungalow was sold and the diggers were going in. And he went and got some and potted it up and named it Harvington Beauty. And we think it's a select form of Transylvanica now. It was listed as a media, but actually John thinks it's Transylvanica. Transylvanica, ordinary Transylvanica is good. Ordinary Nobilis is good. You don't have to go expensive for hepaticas. And um, I don't think Harvington Beauty set seed, which suggests to me it has got some hybrid blood mm. in it. But ordinary Nobilis will set seed and I get seedlings popping up, interesting seedlings of uh, nobilis. thing you've got to do is make sure they don't get hot in the summer, so you put them on the cooler side of a shrub rather than the sunnier side. But then you can put something lovely on the sunnier side, like a, a little bath or something. <laughs> we're very lucky to have gardens, aren't we, all oh, of us? And we're very lucky to have you to inspire us. It's very, I get very excited at this time of year because everything is possible and I haven't made a thousand million mistakes yet and ruined everything. So it's a really lovely point in the year. Well, mistakes are what make you learn. Well, that is true. That is very true. Don't be ashamed of a mistake. That's and every year, my, my New Year's resolution is to be less critical because I think if you, much like with ourselves, you look back at previous years and you generally think none of the disasters were as bad as you thought they were. And actually, you weren't focusing on the things that had worked. So every year, I mean to do more of that, but then yes. I focus on the failures. The glass half full approach yes. to gardening because it swings and roundabouts. Nothing works every year, does it? You know, no, it doesn't. <laughs> That's what makes it interesting too, isn't it? Yes, um, yes. <laughs> I, I feel like I am now brimming with so much FOMO, Val, and you've reminded me of a ton of things that i even forgotten I wanted. Um, so I suppose we should move on to the FOMO part of the podcast. If you are joining us for the first time, this is a feeling I'm sure you're familiar with, that flower, that plant that is giving you a fear of missing out. It might even be something you've grown before, but it's died. Or maybe it's something fabulous and new that you would like to add to your garden. Mine actually came from Snowdrop Day, and it isn't a snowdrop, but well, there were lots of those as well, but let's not, let's not go down that route. We'd be here for about four hours or more. Um, so I saw it for sale on Joe's Monk Silver nursery table, but then I saw it in your garden, Alan, and it's a little uh, Leucogium vernum called Green Lantern. Yeah. Which I then yeah, I saw on the Picton Garden Instagram yesterday, which reminded me how wonderful it was and how it stole my heart on Snowdrop Day. And it is a lovely thing. You both nodded, so obviously you agree. Mm. Yes, I grow it. Um, it's not in a good place. Leucosium is like quite damp soil. And one of the things I've got on my to-do list is when it starts to fade and die down to dig it up and give it more of a chance in a cooler spot because it's quite near the house and it gets too much of a bake. I've got another one called Janus, which is good, which flowers earlier, which also came from Joe Sharman. Yes. Lovely thing. Yeah, I, I, I've got it on the list. It was quite pricey, which is why I don't own it. I mean, not pricey in the scheme of like the, yes. the panty panty well, panty, but Send me an email. Keep sending me emails. And <laughs> when I split mine up, I'll send you a, a bulb. It might be a niggardly bulb, but because uh, it's not, it's been stressed. And, it, and it's actually full of shoots, but no flower at the moment. You know, you made me feel better, uh, Val, when you did your talk at Allen's, because I always feel like doing this podcast, I get... I have been given some really wonderful things. And Jack Og, uh, what was it, a couple of podcasts back, we were talking about the Myersia chiliensis, which I was completely taken by. And bless him, he sent one with Ben Preston to Alan uh, the other day. So thank you, Jack. And I'm very excited. But I never can give any of you fabulous people anything good in return. But you said in your talk that you can never give all the top snowdrop people anything good. No, I can't. I can't. I can't give... Um, Richard Bashford is coming today. Um, I am giving him a trillium, which is a historic trillium, which I had for probably for 15 years now. And I just happen to have two of them. And I want to give him one um, because he's such a good grower. But generally, I can't give people snowdrops who are, you know, at the top of the, ash, uh, the, top of the flight. So when I stayed with Rosie Steele, who discovered Diggory, um, I took her a snowdrop apron um 
and a snowdrop tea towel. That's what I'm reduced to. <laughs> because I couldn't... She give her loved that. She absolutely yeah. loved that. I think she did like it. Yeah, she wore she it. She did very much. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 The thing about plants is you've got to pass them around because um, you never know when, you know, what's going to happen to you. You know, you do you. You don't know from one day to next. We're not no, in charge of our own destiny, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a higher order up there. And, you know, you want you want these plants to continue. I, I've given some candle power away this year. Um, you know, even though I, I buy it every time I see it, I want other people to grow it as well. So yeah. I, do, I do like uh, to, to, to try to give things away, especially to younger gardeners, you know, who, who are build, building up a collection. It, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. And it also is quite good. It really inspires people like me to get better at gardening quicker so that we don't kill off these precious gifts that we oh, get given. I think uh, killing off is part of gardening, actually. <laughs> but you have to, again, it's the glass half full. You think, well, that's died up. Put something else in there. <laughs> Well, that's very exciting. Green Lantern uh, was a very fervent flomo when I saw it uh, on Snowdrop yeah. Day. Val, what's your flomo? I think I, I think I might know where you're going to go with your flomo. Well, I think you probably do because it is a snowdrop and it is that expensive snowdrop. <laughs> yeah, it's golden tears. And will the person? I put in an article that I wrote online in the Telegraph that if the person does cut it up in June and it fails, golden tears will take on a new significance. <laughs> Because, you know, I couldn't cut one bulb or something up to save my life. I wouldn't have the nerve to do it. But I, I, well, I was actually thinking when we were talking about that, you'd need one for the garden and one to cut up, wouldn't you? Yes, but it doesn't work like that. I mean, no. I've, I've, seen, I've seen people cut things up. Um, you know, I've seen a new bulb come. And then, I, you know, I've been, actually been there later in the year when that bulb has been cut up and it's the only one in existence. And I just couldn't do it, but they do mm. do it. So, and of course, it's the chippers, the people who cut these snowdrops up and propagate them, who make them available quickly. Because if you've got one bulb, even if you cut it into 20, you've got 21 of them four years later, whereas it would probably take 10 years to get 21. You know, it's much quicker. Yeah, yeah. So, my Plomo is definitely Golden Tears. I grow Golden Fleece. And uh, there's a Norfolk uh, galanthophile called Brian Ellis, um, who's got 35 flowers on his. My golden fleece has a meagre two. But there are things I like about golden fleece. It is a yellow trim type, so it is a breakthrough plant. But I don't particularly like the foliage because it's a little bit like Wendy's gold. It's a bit yellow looking and it has a sort of floppy look to it. But this um, golden tears... Is, is a very different thing because it's it's um, it's a much tighter shape. It's a much tighter bell, got a big yellow ovary and a really bold yellow crescent. It reminds me of bumblebee, which is a green snowdrop. It has a strong stem and then the foliage is quite, is lowish, which I always think is a good thing with um, a snowdrop to have, you know, to have the flower, uh, and then the and then the foliage rather like that, you know, not like this, so that they're competing with each other. And I probably have to wait um, four or five years at least before that comes down into my price bracket, uh, and, and I buy it. And then who knows? I may not buy it. Uh, I, I might be completely destitute by then <laughs> from buying <laughs> snowdrops. <laughs> I stop writing. I won't be buying any snowdrops. <laughs> But hopefully at that point, all the people who you've been giving plants to for years will no, start giving like you. Because I'm giving people further down the ladder plant. <laughs> They've got nothing to give me uh, back. <laughs> you know, so that I'm not going to get anything that I haven't got from them. And 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 all the high, I've never been in the snowdrop bitterati, you see. I am not in that tight top layer of galanthophiles. And quite frankly, I'm quite pleased I'm not in it because I can view it from the outside with a little bit of humour. <laughs> so I think I don't think I'll ever be given it. And saying that, um, actually, um, John Grimshaw did give me green tear, probably eight or nine years ago now. 
And um, Alan Treat of Avon Bowls did give me his Midas. So I have had things given to me, but mainly I'm afraid it, it's the envelopes of cash. And one of the things I said about Joe Sharman was that he's got three phones. It's max of drug dealing. <laughs> The snowdrops are a bit like drug dealing because out come the envelopes <laughs> of money. You don't keep it in your purse. You keep it in an envelope at the bottom of your bag and you tell yourself you are not going to go into that envelope, but you push you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, out comes the money. So, yes, because he doesn't answer any of his phones. He's famous for not answering the phone. Yes, he is. I'll concur. <laughs> yes, yes. So you, it's no good ringing, Joe, as I found when I was lost in Norfolk. <laughs> he said, ring me and I'll come and find you. Well, A, my phone didn't work in most of Norfolk, so I had to keep driving back to Coltershall. Is it Coltershall? It is Coltershall. Yes. To actually get a signal and phone him again. I phoned him for an hour and a half and each call got more and more frantic <laughs> before finally some kind soul took me in and actually guided me to Rosie Steele's house. Which is tucked away. Tucked away with no name on the front. Yes. Number eight might have been useful. <laughs> and how, how many streets are there in Norfolk, the streets? <laughs> Alan Gray, what is your FLOMO this week? Well, at the risk of um, joining the Brian Ellis fan club, um, who does, who's such a generous man, I have to say that, because lots of the people that you buy snowdrops off, it is, it's, £150 for a single bulb, and you pay £150, and that's what you get, single bulb. Now, if you buy snowdrops from Brian, Brian Ellis, there is at least two bulbs in the pot, sometimes more. Um, and this year, I've been lucky enough to, grow, uh, to buy golden fleece from him. And I bought two pots, and that's my extravagance to me for being locked away for nearly two years and um, not being able to go out. Um, and one pot had two flowers on it, and the other pot, dare I tell you, had five flowers. <gasps> I mean, that is very generous. It is. Um, and you think of the, the cost of the single bulb. And I said to him, I said, Brian, you're very generous when you when we buy snowdrops from you because there's never just a single bulb. And he said, well, there is sometimes. And I said, but, you know, my golden place has got five flowers on it. And he said, well, they're only bulbs at the end of the day, aren't they? Yes, he's um, and I just thought, yeah, what a lovely yeah. nature. Yes. So I've satisfied myself and I have got golden fleece. I agree with everything that you say, Val. Um, the other thing that I don't like it, I mean, you'd said the foliage slightly yellowish. I agree with that. I don't like the fact that it appears to be quite diminutive at the moment. Yeah, I don't mind the small ones, actually. No. I mean, I, I think when you the, when you get a clump of a small one, I think it's lovely. I mean, you're you're judging. I mean, you imagine that with thirty five flowers like Brian's has got. Yes. And mine is still in its water lily pot, and I have a system where if I get an expensive bulb, I put it in a water lily square pot because I've got a cat that scratches them up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that just stops it. And then I put a coloured label in it when I think it needs splitting up. So I bought some coloured labels. And one of the jobs after the podcast is to go and stick coloured labels in water <laughs> lily pots that need to come up. And that's all of them. And then it will probably spread. I won't do it until the summer. No. But at well, least if I put a label in it, a coloured red label. I've got some chance of remembering to do it. Exactly. And you can do it in the summer when they're dormant. Yeah. Carrying on with the, the Galanthus theme two of my um flomos are and one i'm trying to buy at the moment is is a, a snowdrop with a yellow ovary it's quite a strong grower it stands up very well it's called treasure island yes and i saw that at john morley's and i liked it very much i was immediately drawn to it the the thing was that graham my other half was actually drawn to it and he's not a, a snowdrop person at all and he said what's that it's a very good yellow. I've got four flowers on mine. So but I'm trying to get that. The other snowdrop that has taken my fancy, and I've just said to you that I don't like little ones, but I did like this, and it is gracilis, and I haven't seen it before. And at Rosie Steele, she had it growing in some gravel at the base of one of her stone yes. troughs. Yes, and, these... and it's got the curly foliage, hasn't it? Yes, the lovely foliage. little curly foliage. Yes. The foliage, the flowers are nothing to write home about. I mean, they're not striking in any way, but it was just, yeah, it was just the habit of the plant. I've got one called Glen Chantry Poppet, which is not very big, 
pop it yeah. sideways. I like that yeah. very much because it has a little spade that rises above it and makes a tight clump. And I've just yeah. ordered one from John Morley, although I haven't heard whether I've actually got one yet, called Papagino, which is a small, short version of Green Tear, and it has very oh, small right. bulbs. And I, I absolutely, you know, would die for Papagino. <laughs> I think one of the things that's great about Snowdrops is, as Alan just testified with Graham there, is even people who aren't really into them, they get drawn to certain looks and certain types. I mean, yes. I dragged the yeah. other half to the snowdrop event and he really, the garden, he's, he's here for the lawn. He's not interested yes. really in anything else. And, um, and yeah, he's he disappointed really... here. <laughs> <laughs> he's increasingly disappointed here. He, um, he got really into sort of looking at them all and in the end uh, ended up choosing out Little Dorrit as one of his favourites. Yes, because I've got he ob Dorrit. obviously likes the little ones. And I've got um, um, Bambino and Cherub. They're, they're short ones as well. And I've got one called Lady Pump, Lady Putnam. That's it, Lady Putnam, which is so dinky. And, it, and it's just about that tall. <laughs> it's got one tiny little flower. And I don't know whether it's going to sp ever spread because, you know, it's not, it's obviously not very vigorous, but um, the ones where- well, I'm, I'm just going to ask you something. Do you have, as you live in the Cotswolds, do you have any stone troughs in your garden? Yes, we have one and yeah. it's got cyclamen in it and it came from my husband's uh, family home and I would love to have more, but they're mega expensive here. Are they? Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds. I mean, we've, oh, right. missed, yeah. we've missed the time when they were cheap to buy. Yeah. Uh, and I have upset the best beloved because it's it's his it's just got seeding cyclamen in it. And it was came, well, they all came from one plant, which was Tile Barn Elizabeth, yeah. which I got from the Tile Barn Nursery in Kent from Peter. Name escapes me, Peter. I can see him. Uh, anyway, um, I have put a very expensive crocus bulb in there, which I got from rare plants. And one bulb was about 18 pounds. And um, can I go and get the name? Yeah. It's just outside the door. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one with extreme stone trough envy because that wonderful one you have on legs with your weeping rosemary in yeah. it and all of you. Oh, I mean, that is just the stuff of dreams. Well, they're not real. Is that one not real? No, they're not real. They, they, I couldn't afford the real yeah. ones either. Okay, with a big label. Crocus ruginensis, so that came from um, Janice Ruxans, from Latvia, uh, Bell Phoebe. And it's, um, it's rather a bit like a Heflianus type, and it's got purple and white on it. And I, I stuck it in there because I didn't want a squirrel to dig it up, basically. And he's rather upset with me because his little tub of cyclamen, which he has nothing, had nothing to do with, because the ants spread the cyclamen seeds. They don't, you know, they, they, they pop up everywhere. They don't carry them far, but it's only a trough about that big, you see. It's only like a, you know, small trough. And it's absolutely full of cyclamen. It's a real sight at this time of year. And in the middle of it are two white labels and a crocus spike. And he's just not impressed. <laughs> but I don't have many stone troughs is the answer. Unfortunately, I, I'm not a wealthy woman. I say to my children, I would be a wealthy woman if it wasn't for plants and brora. <laughs> so I've got this, I've ruined his cyclamen tub. So the answer is I don't have enough stone well, troughs. While you nipped out to get that label, I was saying to Alan, I covered his troughs, but I've just, it's turned out some of them aren't real. But they look so real. Well, you they, can you, make them, can't you? With um... Yeah, there, there was a... There was um, a, a man and his son, I can't remember, they're not in existence anymore, and they had a series of designs and it's reconstituted stone. Yes. Um, but they, they're moulded to look like um, yes. a natural one. Um, but they were, I mean, they were about seven or eight hundred pounds each, I have to say, but even so, I mean, the, yes, should we say I mean, if, the others were much more? If you get a big stone trough, you'll pay hundreds and hundreds for it. And then you're going to give yourself a hernia moving it. You'll, you'll pay 5000 for a big one. Yes. I haven't got that sort of money. I Neither have I. I, was, well, I, I certainly I, haven't. I was a brown owl and a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the background. <laughs> well, there's hope for me yet. Maybe I just need to get a fake stone trough. I have nowhere to put it at the moment anyway. That's another dream. Well, there is a way of doing them. 
um, on the Alpine Garden Society where you get you start off with a Belfast sink and then you coat it with something, you coat it with a mixture and there's actually a recipe for it. And um, it was a very popular thing to do when Belfast sinks were around. Now, I am fortunate to have a daughter as a plumber. And in my time, I have had a lot of Belfast sink, <laughs> but I actually left them at my old house because I only had a week to move. And uh, I went for the plants rather than uh, the Belfast sinks. But you could make your own. Yeah. And you and actually, I, I never really paid attention to how much money they are. But Belfast sinks turn up in reclamation yards all the time. And there, there must yeah. be, you know, cheaper ones. Yeah. So. I mean, you, you start with a Belfast sink and then there's some sort of recipe that you smear it over with. And they do seem to sort of last for quite a long time. We need to go well, and I'm find... I was going to say, there's something else that you can use, which is not as, as much cheaper than a Belfast sink. Um, and that is those kind of polystyrene cases that you... Yeah, fish your, cases. Your mm. green grace grocer will have lettuce yes, in or some, yeah, something like yeah. that. I mean, they're um, very useful for storing dahlias in. Yeah, exactly. Huh? Insulated. Yes. And that, what you do is you cover them with some chicken wire, um, which helps to make the form more sturdy and then you slap your stuff on your mixture on um and i would just advise people when they're doing it to turn it upside down and do the bottom first that's and let that a good <laughs> a good tip then you can turn it the right way up when it's dry and you can do the artistic bit yeah <laughs> Do you know, I think I might need to do some more research on this. If people uh, watch this but don't follow our social media, you might not know we've just launched a newsletter, which is going to be approximately monthly. But it's to sort of put little articles in, updates from Alan and East Rust and a little um, kind of... Well, while we're on the subject of things like that, there's a new book um, which has come out with Pimpernel Press on crevice gardening. Oh, Yes. That so nice. I mean, that's becoming quite popular again, making these, uh, you know, putting... Um, uh, slates and stones vertically at an angle and then planting up the crevices. I couldn't do it. <laughs> to, to, a bit like ironing, really, isn't it? A bit too <laughs> fastidious. I tell you who does some very interesting troughs like that, and that is Darcy and Everest. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they make they make sort of like rivers of, of flint um, and various other stones, and they plant them up, and they, they just look so lovely. They had them at the Chelsea Flower Show, yeah. do you remember? Yeah, it was wonderful. Yes. I will link to um, the podcast we did with Darcy and Everest, where you can kind of hear a bit more about yes. that and some of their, their well, wonderful Well, um, Joe Elliott's nursery, he was a big alpine man. He was Clarence's son. Uh, he had a nursery at Broadwell, which is quite a few, just a few miles from here. Snowdrop named Broadwell as well. Quite a nice one, green-tipped. Anyway, um, he had the most wonderful collection of troughs and his son still has them. And they are just magnificent stone sort of coffins and fonts and all sorts of things. <laughs> but out of my price range, sadly. Yeah. Well, I, I will. Um, yeah. I, if people want to keep updated with our newsletter, it's very easy. Go to our website where you can sign up for it. And actually the first installment is there to read. So getgardeningnow.co.uk. There's a newsletter section of the website. So you can read the first installment there, sign up to get it delivered to your email inbox when we do the next one. But I'm thinking maybe I need to do some research and put together an article on how to create your own imitation stone trough. Because if anyone yeah. listening and viewing is like me, that is very much on the wish list. Yes. Val, as ever, You've been marvellous. I don't think much. I have. I talk too much. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Not Let's at just all. say, on a podcast, that is preferable to talking too little. <laughs> is it? You have people who are very shy and reserved. <laughs> um, no, no, not really. Yeah. It's not because really what we go for. <laughs> people say to me, "Why? how did you get into gardening? And I have to say I was noisy. <laughs> I used to wake people up, so they took me out. Absolutely true. Also, do you know what? Even if people are quiet, maybe if you were to talk to them just making small talk, how many gardeners, once you get them started on plants, do you know who aren't extremely chatty? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Very so true. We've got the right topic. Please come back soon. But in the meantime, thank you for being so entertaining and bringing along such wonderful plants. I'm feeling thoroughly inspired. Uh, until we meet again, but not for a while. <laughs> I don't want to take over your podcast. It's because you don't want to cut any more things out of your garden. That's why. Yeah, probably. <laughs> no, I don't mind. I do. I, I cut all my dahlias because they're on the allotment. I do cut a lot of stuff. 
But I don't particularly like cutting spring stuff because it doesn't last very long in warm temperatures, does it? No. no. They're already flagging some of these things. <laughs> Well, we'll let you go and enjoy them. Uh, yeah, well, it's they... lovely to talk to you both. You do. Happy gardening, Bye-bye. everybody. Can I go and show you my, my pillowcases, <laughs> which are the same as my duvet? Yes. I think I have got my Flomo, actually. Perhaps it'll be golden tears. It is. <laughs> uh, I just... Sorry, I've forgotten. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> so, Alan's distracted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right, but stop. Duvet cover because the sheets are actually real on the bed. Oh, look! Uh, snowdrops! <laughs> yes! Snowdrops! <laughs> it had to be. It had to be. Hey.